again, preeminent people, uh, when I think of sports attorneys on the player side, there's no name that comes up before one Jeff Kessler. And like I mentioned with Brian Westbrook, uh, it's just such an honor that I can call Jeff uh, sometime in the spring every few years and say, can you join? And he says, just tell me where and when. Uh, Jeff Kessler, as has been mentioned by Jamie, NBA Players Association and our executive director will be up here next. NFL Players Association, U.S. soccer, women's soccer team, which we'll talk about, U.S. women's hockey team, players individually, Tom Brady, as you may remember. Um, so these are the kind of things that uh, we can bring here, the insights of Jeff, and of course, uh, all was discussed on the prior panel with NCAA issues and pay for play, the force behind that on the legal front is Jeffrey Kessler, and we'll talk about that. Penny Lee has a legislative angle that is unique, talking about gender equity and women's issues, and I'll start with you there. So HR 7 is out. It is a legislative piece trying to uh, get what we all want, which is sort of gender equity, what Jamie talked about, the disparities here. So your work, you have an insight as to how we're addressing that legislatively. Yeah, it's one of those things that elections matter. Yeah. Um, and so what we saw in the 2018 election was a sea change as to who was now representing uh, in Congress. We now have back as the speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and with that she has 100 women now behind her that for the first time have been elected into Congress. So this is a, she, a, a sea change in that it does, the speaker can dictate what is on the agenda to a much greater effect than what they can in the Senate. So she really can drive and put forth what she wants to in the agenda that it is. And so you would have to be completely deaf not to have understood that part of the movement, and it really truly was a wave, a, wom a women's ele waved election, not only from participation, um, and you saw record numbers turning of women turning out to vote, but also now as far as who was elected. And so that is dictating what is on. So um, as they come into every new Congress, every new bill gets attached to numbers. So the seventh bill that was addressed, HR 7, was the Paycheck Fairness Act. Um, this was done on purpose. It was done with thought. Um, and a lot of questions were, were put out to say, well, didn't we already establish that in 1963 with the Equal Protection Act? Um, yes, but what, in, what we have seen is that there, and as Jamie has alluded to in some of the statistics that she just stated, that there hasn't been equity as far as on the pain as, since 1963, women still make 83% to the dollar of which the man does. And so a lot of women in Congress led by Rosa DeLauro out of Connecticut. Uh, this is a bill that she has put forth for the last 10 years, finally was able to bring it to the floor. And it was to correct the, there was a line in the Equal, Prote Equal Protection Act that said you can discriminate based on sex or you can allow for sex not to influence the salary if that is based off of seniority, merit, provision, and anything other than sex. And so what they were trying to do was tighten that definition of anything other than sex. Um, and so what it did was it addressed is no retaliation. If you have somebody that goes and puts forth a complaint um, that says that, that they are not getting equal compensation, oftentimes in a workforce environment, there would be a retaliation against that worker. So it was trying to eliminate that retaliation. Also one of the determining factors was wage history. Um, oftentimes women come into various promotions and they've consistently been at a bottom rung so therefore, even when they go to a promotion or to a new job, based on prior work history, they aren't able to be able to garner the wages of which a man does in that same role. So things such as that. So there was all a tightening of various different languages to get at that, what they felt was a discriminatory allowance of the notion of anything other than sex. So that was what they did. It has passed the House. It passed majority with just uh, Democrats. Only one, Chris uh, Smith out of Connecticut, was the only Republican that voted for it. Uh, it now will get kicked over to the Senate of where, um, and being a Senate alumni of Harry Reid, I can tell you, the Senate is where all good things go to die, oftentimes. <laughs> um, but in the Senate, we do not have the lead. We obviously do not have the same type of leadership. Um, as Speaker Pelosi and Mitch McConnell right now is not, uh, has, in, has no willingness to bring that up to bear. So again, it will be a now, it will go forth, but right now there is no movement past the House.
Jeff, on the sports side, was the UN was the recent U.S. women's soccer action by you, first with the EOC in 2016, was that your first foray into this issue on the player front with the equal opportunity, the gender part of it? As terms of filing a lawsuit, yes. Uh, but actually, um, when the women's tennis players were working to get equal prize money yeah. uh, in the four slams uh, and in the uh, highest level of the WTA events, uh, we were actually counseling them uh, on those efforts as well. So that was probably my first foray uh, into trying to get uh, equal uh, pay. Uh, but the uh, women's soccer team yeah. uh, is the first lawsuit. So I've take us inside the, the actions, first the EOC action, now the litigation on behalf of the women's soccer team. How did you get involved? Yes. So this went back to the women were doing a new collective bargaining agreement. Right. And at that time, this was several years ago, uh, we were retained as we often are on the player side to give advice. And the first thing we do is we look at the facts, the underlying facts, the economics of the industry, how they were being treated. And it immediately occurred to us that this was a violation of both Title VII and the Equal Pay Act. Because, because uh, why? The, and you don't often have this precise set of circumstances that present themselves in sports. And the reason is to state a legal claim under those statutes, you need a common employer. Well, in most of these sports, there is not a common employer for the male and female athletes. Here there was. Uh, it was the United States Soccer Federation uh, has a national team for men and a national team for women, and they all enter into employment agreements with those teams. In fact, there was a union for both the men and the women, uh, different unions who were negotiating. Okay. And so it set itself up where you had male and female athletes who were doing essentially the same job. Uh, and the main two differences were that the women's team was phenomenally successful and the men's team was not. Uh, and if you looked at <laughs> Spoken it... Spoken like their lawyer. Uh, if, <laughs> it, it, I mean, the facts are the facts. And, and, the, uh, and on a revenue basis, the women's team was much more profitable for the United States Soccer Federation uh, than when the men's team. So you didn't have some of the issues you could get into you know, in other sports where the men's teams are just generating much more money. That was not the case with the women's team. Yet, they were making 70% or less than what the men's team was making. So like, what's up with that? What's up with that is discrimination, okay? It's very much a reflection of what we've just heard about. It's a national issue, it's not a sports issue, uh, but the women on this team who are phenomenal athletes and are phenomenal leaders, said we're going to stand up and do something about it, not just for themselves, but really as an example to try to use sports, as it often can be, uh, as a positive example for the world in terms of that. So they started this struggle with an EOC complaint a few years ago. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the EEOC uh, is not the most active body in the world uh, these days. <laughs> and so the investigation continued and continued and continued. Uh, and finally, the women said... Was there said, any way you could prod that along as the attorney? Uh, or that would... We prodded as much as we can, and there were efforts to try to mediate a settlement. Uh, but all of that went nowhere. And finally, the women said, enough is enough. Uh, they were going to file their own lawsuit. And every single member of the current team joined in as an individual plaintiff. So while it is also a class action for the players who came previously, uh, going back to the statute of limitations, uh, each member of the team wanted to individually join to show their unity on this issue. You represent a lot of men's organizations. Is yes. it different representing women's organizations? No, in fact, the male athletes 
have been tremendously supportive of the women on this. The men's national team said they hope the women get every penny and they deserve it. Many of the players have spoken out about that. Um, I see some other athletes from the various sports I'm involved in, whether it's the NBA or the NFL, all of those athletes have said right on, <laughs> you know, go get that money uh, for the women as well. They deserve it. So there's been no problem there. What is the defense being offered by the U.S. Soccer Federation, why they won't pay? So they have a variety of defenses. Um, one of their defenses is they're trying to deny that, in fact, they should be treated as a common employer because there are two different teams. Um, I don't think that is legally correct, but that's one of the defenses that they've made. Um, a second defense they've made is that somehow it's okay because there was a union and the union agreed to what the women are getting in bargaining, and therefore that's some type of waiver. Um, for all of you who know the law in this area, unions cannot waive Title VII. <laughs> unions cannot waive the Equal Pay Act any more than a union could agree to waive the minimum wage laws <laughs> of the states. Uh, those base requirements apply uh, whether or not you have a union agreement. By the way, the union want an equal pay, uh, and the only reason they didn't get it is because the USSF said no. <laughs> and they then had to decide whether to take a significant advancement, which they did get in their last deal, uh, and work, uh, or to not work at all, which they thought would be uh, more destructive their sport. So what they concluded they would do is that they would do the best they could in collective bargaining, but then assert their legal rights, which is exactly what they are doing here. So that's a defense that's been raised. And the last one is uh, it sort of blames somebody else. So they say, well, we'd love to pay the women the same, but you know, FIFA uh, doesn't give us the same amount of money for the World Cup for the women as they do for the men, which is true. But that has nothing to do, in our view, with what the USSF does with their money. Okay, FIFA is not in this country. I can't sue them under Title Seven. Uh, or you would if you could. The I'm Equal sure. Pay Act, but I can sue the USSF, and they are required to treat the women equally under the law, regardless as to whether the rest of the world is discriminating or not. And frankly, what what USSF should be doing is saying, you know what, we've got the money, we are going to treat these women fairly, and let's set an example for the rest of the world. Maybe they'll come to that. We hope they'll come to that. If not, we think that eventually a jury is going to make them come to that. And what's been so impressive is your star players, and this happens, I'm going to talk to Michelle about the NBA players like Chris Paul and LeBron. Your star players have stepped up, been very vocal, been out in the media, Alex Morgan, etc. cetera. Uh, that obviously shows the passion that these women have for this. There's no question about it. They feel, look, they get letters from little girls all over the country who are so excited about them fighting for equal rights. You know, you know my, my granddaughter, who's four years old, knows they're fighting for equal rights. She doesn't <laughs> understand even the issue. That's not why because would, she, she's your granddaughter? Yeah, yeah, why, <laughs> why would women make less if they're just as good? She doesn't understand that issue. Right. You know, I don't understand that issue. I'm like her. And so this is something that has to be established and fought for. And Penny, sports, we talked, Val, I think Mark Jackson talked about sports being the whatever, the window, the, the porch, the front gate for everything else in the universities. It seems like these, these women athletes' stars can be that for what you're talking about legislatively. Yeah, and they have been, um, you know, tremendous advocates um, for this issue, obviously putting forth on a day-to-day -day basis um, and letting the action speak for their words and, and putting it back up and being willing to take the risks uh, risks of their own job, risk of their own security, risks of the you know never being able to be, be to be able to play again, and so they put it forth out there, and so a, a, you know tremendous amount of people have applauded not only the soccer's but also you know Serena and Venus and what they did with the tennis and and, and you know asking for it, and so 
you know, as as the, as the as the as the saying is, you know, the the uh, you know, with Martin Luther King and that the arc of justice is slowly bending, and and you're starting to see that it, it takes a tremendous amount of time to change these ways and to change this behavior, and it has to be done with intention. Um, you know, recently California just passed a law in which they are requiring now public public companies uh, that are based within California to have a certain percentage of women on the boards. There's criticism. Uh, I was on a panel recently with a congressman, and he said, you know, I don't think that we should be doing that legislatively, or I don't think we should be doing that through the laws. Well, the problem is for the last 100 or 250 years, the behavior hasn't changed. And so similar to what we had to do was to force laws and to force regulations down to be able to change on, ra on racial uh, disparities and to be able to open up our schools, open up our businesses, other things for war to allow for not to allow for racial discriminatory issues to occur, but also in the same thing we feel it on gender. And so I see you are just at the tip of the iceberg right now, as far as on a national conversation. Um, it is front and center. Uh, you know, right now when you only have nine percent of the boards in America uh, being having a woman on that board. Of the, or of the Fortune 500, only 24 CEOs are women. You are having that conversation because you also have seen at the end of the day, it's a profitable thing to have. When you have a gender diverse board, 20, your percentage of income goes up 24%. Your, your profits go up 24%. So it is a profitable thing to do. So people are recognizing it, they're understanding it. The overarching cloud of Me Too, Time's Up, those conversations are also occurring and kind of pushing this and propelling it forward. So I think you're only at the tip of the iceberg. Jeff, what was talked about last panel was uh, obviously some, some financial constraints with some of the pay for play stuff that you're behind with the Austin case uh, due to Title IX issues. So here we are, gender equity versus pay for play, two issues that you're both involved with. Can you square those? Sure. Um, if Title IX applies with respect to the payments of compensation and benefits to college athletes, then I think that's great. What will be the result? The result will be that more athletes will get the compensation. And if there are financial constraints, maybe the men will get a little less and the women will then be brought up to them, and that's terrific, okay? I don't know if Title IX requires that or not. Um, I wish it did, frankly, from, from my standpoint. The reason I don't know is because there are a lot of decisions that say you don't have to spend the same uh, on teams uh, for men and women under Title IX. So, for example, uh, I can tell you right now, uh, every major football school spends vastly more on their football team uh, than they do on all their women's sports put together, and that's not a Title IX violation. What Title IX's been held to protect is the equality of the availability of scholarships. That it's 100% protects, and it's had a dramatic example. So I'd be in favor of it applying, uh, but I don't know if it applies. But in any event, um, that'll just determine how the money uh, is shared, and I'm in favor of greater shares, not lesser she has to live. But if there, so. if, I guess the question is, if there's more pay for superstars in big time college football or basketball, it will directly affect other sports, minor men's sports, and of course women's sports. No, it won't. How, why not? Okay, so right now we have something called Division Three, right? Division Three has every single team. It has no major sports to support it financially. Okay, same thing in Division 1A, or if you're in the Ivy League, okay, you have no revenue sports. Believe me, I know, I went to Columbia, okay? <laughs> the football team does not generate money to support the other sports in those schools. Every one of those schools has every one of those sports. Why do they get supported? How? The same way that the English department gets supported. English department has no revenues either. The same way that the drama club gets supported. The drama club doesn't have maybe a little tiny bit of revenue as well. Or the school newspaper or anything else. It gets supported because for those other sports, it's part of what the colleges find valuable and offered. This whole idea that somehow the basketball and football players at the revenue sports 
you know, should somehow not get anything because the rowers need it is a canard. It's just not true. It's not true in any sport that's out there. What they're actually supporting is not the rowers. They're supporting, and I'm sorry to say this, the coaches, the athletic directors, the facilities, and everything else. If you're at the University of Alabama, so, you know, the coach, instead of making $11 million, will make $7 million, and the rest will go to those athletes, 95% of which will never go to the NFL, by the way, or to the NBA out of Duke. Most of the players do not go on to professional careers. And instead, this is their one shot to try to reap some benefits out of that. And the money is going, frankly, where it shouldn't go. Which is? To the coaches, the athletic directors, facilities, any place else except to the people who actually generate the money. Where does that case stand? Well, we won. Uh, we had uh, a trial that took place in November, uh, and the NCA restrictions were struck down. We had requested um, two forms of adjunctive re relief, the one that we really preferred, uh, and frankly, the one that we got. Uh, the one that we really preferred would have said the NCAA is just out of this business entirely, uh, and individual conferences could set their own rules and competition with each other as to how to treat their athletes in these revenue sports. And by the way, I don't expect every conference to do the same thing. If you're in the Patriot League, you may not do the same thing for your football players if you're in the SEC, okay? That's just the reality in terms of where the money is in terms of that. It says, but the relief we did get said the NCAA can no longer regulate educational benefits. So what does that mean? Now, all the schools and conferences will be free to do as much as they want in terms of giving postgraduate education scholarships, study abroad, tutoring, computers, work study programs, and most importantly from my standpoint, academic achievement encouragement rewards so that they can go out, for example, and give their athletes $15,000 a year if they're making progress towards their degree and another $15,000 if they get their degree. So it will encourage education. And it was very interesting to me because Mark Emmert uh, recently got interviewed, I guess, about this during the tournament, and he said he thinks comp competition to provide more value in education is a good thing. Well, now he's got it. And despite that fact, by the way, his organization is appealing that. So there's sort of a disconnect between what he said and, and what they're actually doing. And by the way, we're cross-appealing. You're appealing uh, as well. We're appealing because we still think we should get the broader relief. Which is uh, and money. Which would allow the conferences to take over all of this. And uh, we'll see what happens when we get to the Court of Appeals. What's the, sta what's the timing there? You never know. We're probably looking at least a year uh, before we would get a Court of Appeals uh, ruling on this. A year to a year and a half would be typical for the Ninth Circuit in terms of when we'd uh, get a final decision. And Penny, speaking of timing, these bills, I mean, obviously you said we have this encouraging signs in Congress now, but we also know where things go to die. So what's your timing assessment? <laughs> oh, if I had that magic ball. Uh, well, we have 63 legislative days uh, left in the year, uh, stunning with all of the different things. So um, and we have things such as immigration, debt ceiling, um, and a host of, whole host of other revenue and appropriations bills to get through. So on this one, you know, we were also going into the 2020 elections. Um, so we have just a really narrow window this year to actually get some legislative actions done. And then we go into a full-blown presidential and everything kind of gets tied up into all the messaging bills and what needs to go onto the floor. You recently saw, um, you know, in the Senate, they put up... Um, 
a Green New Deal, and that was just to really generate 30-second um, ads off of it. You know, all the Democrats voted against it, so if you can't support that, then how can it be real? So we're going into, by January, we'll be in the complete silly season where most of the bills, other than just to keep the government afloat, will be on a message side, and that will be to affect an election. So. Um, so this one is one, um, again, they, it will be used as a weapon in, in political campaigns. It was able to pass the House with only one Republican saying that they weren't for the equal pay of women. Uh, so that is what these bills are going to be doing now from now until the end of the 2020. And again, we'll go back through and see what the outcome of the election is going to be, uh, whether or not we do have the first woman, uh, whether or not President Trump is reelected or however it gets shaped. So. It, I would say right now um, it is not going to go anywhere, um, but again, being able to use as a, as a, as a tactic, as a strategy um, on the campaign trail uh, between now and the end of the year. And Jeff, the status of the women's suit? So we're at the very early stages of the suit. Uh, right now we're fighting about where it will be heard. So we filed our case uh, in Los Angeles, and there is another case that uh, Hope Solo had individually filed in San Francisco. The uh, USSF had moved to transfer Hope Solo's case to Chicago, where they're headquartered, because they think that they prefer to have the case heard there. Um, this is now all before what we call the multi-district litigation panel, which is a group that decides where to centralize cases when they have common issues. And so we're advocating that everything be heard in Los Angeles. Um, I assume the USSF hasn't responded yet, but I believe they're gonna say Chicago. Uh, and then we'll get a decision on that. Um, there's a hearing on May 30th in New Orleans. Uh, and so it'll be uh, argued then, and we'll get a decision shortly on that in June. Uh, once we know what court we're in, uh, then I expect that there will initially be motions to dismiss filed by the USSF, um, with arguing whatever they get argued to try to say the case shouldn't go forward. Uh, we'll overcome that, uh, and then we'll move into discovery <laughs> and a trial schedule. And um, uh, hopefully uh, within... Um, a year or so of that, uh, if we don't settle and get equal pay through settlement, uh, then we will go to a jury trial. And, and the we, like, we like our chances in front of a jury on this issue. I'm sure you do. The women's team continues to play with the gaps in pay, as we Yes, see. oh, their, their first goal right now is to win the World Cup this year. Of course. And uh, that's what they're focused on, and, uh, and uh, I'm hoping that's what they're going to do. Uh, and uh, that they will continue to play. They made that decision when they decided, uh, rather than strike or face a lockout uh, on collective bargaining, to take their agreement. They still feel that their sport needs to be supported, both in the US and globally, and they were not willing to uh, take a disruption in play over this especially when the legal system offered another alternative for them uh, to seek equal pay. We'll be following it. Thanks so much, Jeff Kessler, Penny Lee. Great discussion.